Good afternoon. Uh, we come today to our last speaker, um, Stefan Spurl. Um, and it's with great pleasure to introduce a professor of Arabic and Middle Eastern Studies and the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics at SOAS University of London. Um, he was born in Stuttgart and brought up in Luxembourg. Um, but if you had the opportunity to speak to Spurl, uh, Stephen Spurl in Arabic, he would have been impressed by his um, kind of Egyptian uh, dialect. I would have thought he was born in, uh, in, <laughs> in Egypt, actually. Um, he studied Arabic at Oxford and the American University in Cairo and did his postgraduate research at SOAS London. Um, he has numerous uh, publications, uh, including Mannerism in Arabic Poetry, uh, Qasida Poetry in Islamic Asia and Africa, um, and uh, other uh, numerous articles uh, on Arabic and Islamic refugee studies. Um, in 2005, he embarked on a research project with Ahmed Mustafa, uh, which resulted in their joint publication, uh, The Cosmic Script, Sacred Geometry and the Science of Arabic, Banmanship, uh, which I believe is uh, the copies displayed outside. Um, the title of his talk today is Ibn Arabi's Doves of the Ark Tree and its Arabian, Quranic and Plotinian antecedents. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to start by thanking Richard for inviting me to speak to you today uh, and to give a paper that he actually heard delivered by me in London last November at the conference uh, on Neoplatonism and Poetry in the Greater Mediterranean which had organized with some colleagues. Well, why, uh, why Neoplatonism? Uh, the Platonic tradition uh, left a lasting impact on poetry in Europe and Western Asia from late antiquity to the present day. And the conference was an attempt to bring scholars together to see uh, what this really amounted to. A key figure in this Platonic tradition is, uh, where is the button? Um, yes. A key figure in this Platonic tradition is Plotinus, an Egyptian philosopher who died in 270 um, and uh, who wrote in Greek and who recast Platonic philosophy uh, with a kind of radical monism, a radical focus on the one as sole origin of everything and to which everything returns, which made his philosophical heritage particularly, I think, appealing um, to the monotheist religions. It was integrated into the philosophy, theology, and especially the mysticism of Judaism in Christianity and Islam in the ensuing, purpose, uh, in the ensuing centuries. What is for us particularly important is um, what happened in Arabic. Um, a number of his writings, um, known as the Enneads, Enne six Enneads there are with nine chapters each, and Aniads 4, 5, and 6 were in excerpts translated, or not really translated, but adapted in Arabic to an, great, to an Islamic context, where they circulated under the title The Theology of Aristotle, The Sayings of a Greek Sage, Epistle of Divine Knowledge. You will see no mention of the name Plotinus. Plotinus was unknown in the Middle East until the 20th century, but his thinking uh, became hugely influential because these books were read and studied by, in the first instance, Islamic philosophers, Al-Kindi, Ibn Sina, uh, Al-Farabi, and they fled, they, 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 they greatly were adapted and influenced Islamic philosophy and theology. And uh, Ibn Arabi certainly was known to have read Ibn Sina, and if he read Ibn Sina, he will come across the thought of uh, this tradition. So the, the, the link, there's unquestionably a link there. Now since the conference dealt with uh, poetry from the three monotheist religions, um, I thought it would be appropriate when it came to the um, Arabic side to focus on a poem which you all know, but those at the conference, most of them didn't know it, that famous poem in which the three monotheist religions are mentioned and uh, which Michael Sells in a wonderful article has discussed and also beautifully translated. And for me, it's a special honor, a daunting honor to talk about this poem in his presence. In actual fact, he should have given that paper at the conference, but unfortunately, he couldn't make it. So what I'd like to do in this uh, presentation is to look at this poem 
at the themes and structure of the poem to see to what extent and in what way it carries echoes or points of convergence with the thought of Plotinus and to see where this will lead us in the end. Uh, as we all know, the poem features in the famous Tajurman al-Ashwaq, and the first point of convergence with Plotinus is already right in the beginning of Ibn Arabi's introduction, because in the introduction, one of the introductions that Michael mentions, Ibn Arabi makes it crystal clear that all these poems have two addressees. There's on the one hand, Nidhan, the woman he fell in love with, and he describes in the most wonderful way this introduction, and also the divinity, God. And the fact that these two addressees are both intended, Ibn Arabi really stresses it. He says, every name I mention is her name, every dwelling place I mention is her dwelling place. So this is not incidental. The two are actually both intended. And this knowledge that the emotion of love is one, um, this is precisely what we also find with Protinus, and here's the first point of convergence already. If we look here, Protinus on love, two brief extracts, he says, the soul in its natural state is in love with God and wants to be united with him because it came from there and it wants to go back to there. This is the natural state and this is the origin of all love. And then he says, love us and the beloveds here below imitate this, this particular desire to return to the one and in their will to be united. So crystal clear, there's one feeling which has two possible significations, an earthly and a heavenly. And that's the hallmark of all Neoplatonic love poetry that we studied at the conference. Whether it's in Spanish, Arabic, Italian, Turkish, throughout, it's the same. So the next point of convergence is linked to these two very, very famous lines, which everyone knows and which I would like to invite you to look at with new eyes. My heart has come to adopt every form, a, graze, a, a grazing ground for gazelles and a cloister for monks, a temple for idols and a Kaaba for the circling pilgrim, tablets for a Torah and scrolls for a Quran. What do these lines mean? In this wonderful book, Mystical Languages of Unsaying, which has been shown to you before, I show it again, uh, those of you who haven't seen it, I warmly recommend it. In this great book, Michael has shown that these lines cannot be taken at face value, that at the, at, at the heart of these lines resides a paradox. It's the paradox between the absolute transcendence of the Lord, who is unmanifest, absolute unity, utterly beyond comprehension of the human senses, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the Lord as immanently manifest, self-disclosed in a multiplicity of guises uh, accessible to the senses. So we have two things that can't possibly be true at the same time, but they are. And the impossibility of understanding this is inaccessible to the human intellect. Only the heart is able to comprehend the paradox. And for this reason, it is stated in these lines the heart, my heart, is capable of adopting every form. The heart can understand it, but the mind cannot. And here we find two further points of convergence between uh, Plotinus and Ibn Arabi. Um, the first one is the notion of transcendence. Plotinus says, the one is in truth beyond all statement. You cannot say anything about him whatsoever. Even the word him is wrong. Why? Any affirmation is of a thing. Anything you affirm in language is about something, and this one is not a thing. So you can't talk about it, you can't know anything about it. Now Ibn Arabi says the same thing, but what is very interesting is that, and we'll find this throughout, the Plotinian echo in Ibn Arabi doesn't go to Plotinus in the first instance, it goes to the Quran. For Ibn Arabi, the source of this is in the Quran, there is nothing like him. Now, it's wrong to translate this as there is nothing. The Quran says there is no thing like him. The Lord is not a thing. 
is not confined like a thing, and as it is, he's not confined, we can't actually talk about him either in the, in the real ultimate sense of the word. So there's an exact pa parentage here between the Ennead idea of thing, the te, and the she in the Quran. And also when it comes to reason, the, um, the limitation, the incapacity of reason is uh, in the Arabic Plotinus translation, for instance, described as follows. When the intellect, when intellect darts forth towards the almighty creator, it comprehends of him, of him a small and scanty thing. But as for his full description, intellect will never be capable of comprehending or describing it. You notice the reference to the almighty creator. That's what the Arabic translator added. This is not Plotinus, this is Quranic speak. So this translation fuses already Plotinus with the Islamic tradition. But the idea is there, Al-Aql is incapable of grasping the problem. Again, as Michael beautifully made clear in his discussion, for Ibn Arabi, the Shahid, the, the proof of this is not Plotinus, it's the Quran. He says, for instance, um, there is this verse in the Quran, there is truly a reminder in this, in God's greatness, for whoever, who has, for whoever has a heart. Ibn Arabi says, the Quran says a heart, because only the heart can understand the greatness of, of, of the Lord. The mind, al-aql, the intellect, cannot. We will see from now on that the convergences between Butairis and Ibn Arabi, virtually all of them go through the Quran in the first instance. And that's something which is, gives us some food for thought at the end. So, one thing we know by now is that this particular insight, which occurs in these two very famous verses at the end of the poem, is the result of a process of maturing. The heart has achieved the ability to make that step, to grasp this extraordinary thing. My question now is, how does this poem prepare you for this insight? Where, where in the poem is the guide that leads us up to it? And what I'd like you to do in the next three minutes is to read the poem from beginning to end uh, and ask yourself how you feel that this idea we've just discussed is prepared for in the poem and how the poem begins and how it ends. Is there some uh, solution to it? Now there have been handouts. I should say that the handouts didn't look, don't look the way they should have. Uh, they should have been set out, uh, uh, the Arabic in particular should have been set out differently. But there was a problem with the translation by, by computer. Also, the translation is a very prosaic one. It doesn't in any way attempt to rival the poetry of Michael. So uh, that being said, have a look at it. And I will read the poem in Arabic because I think it's important for the poem to be experienced also as the way it should sound or could sound. Let's put it this way. It is in the Mita Tawil. Um, which is one of the most famous Arabic meters. It goes fa'ulun, mafa'ilun, has a particular kind of rhythm, and it has a mono rhyme. So there's one meter and one rhyme. We'll come to that. Ala ya hamamati al arakati wal bani tarafakhna. لا تضعفن بالشجب أشجاني ترفقنا لا تظهرن بالنوح والبكاء خفي صباباتي ومكنون أحزاني أطارحها عند العصيل وبالضحى بحنة مشتاق وأنة هيماني تناوحت الأرواح في غيضة الغضاء فمالت بأفنان علي فأفناني وجاءت من الشوق المبرح والجوى ومن طرف البلوى إلي بأفناني فمل بجمع والمحصب من منا ومل بذات الأثل مل بنعماني تطوف بقلب ساعة بعد ساعة لوجد وتبريح وتلثم أركاني كما طاف خير الرسل بالكعبة التي 
يقول دليل العقل فيها بنقصاني وقبل أحجارا بها وهو ناطق وأين مقام البيت من قدر إنساني فكما عهدت ألا تحول وأقسمت وليس لمخضوب وفاء بأيماني ومن عجب الأشياء الضبي مبرقع يشير بعناب ويوم بأجفاني ومرعاه ما بين الترائب والحشا ويا عجبا من روضة والصنيراني لقد صار قلبي قابلا كل صورة فمرعا لغزلان ودير لرهباني وبيت لأوثان وكعبة طائف وألواح توراة ومصحف قرآني أدين بدين الحب أن توجهت ركائبه فالحب ديني وإيماني لنا أسوة في بشر هند وأختها وقيس وليلى ثم مي وغيلاني So, what do we see in this poem? We don't see a narrative. There's no story being told. We also don't see an argument, a logical argument, in the sense of if X is Z, if X is Y, then Z is A. There's nothing of this. What we see is a juxtaposition of themes, uh, doves, spirits, pilgrimage stations, kissing of stones, gazelles, lovers, how does all this hang together? In what way are these crucial lines we've discussed there being prepared? The answer is clearly not evident. And Ibn Arabi's commentary is no help. His commentary is a reflection on individual lines, precisely in the way that Michael explained earlier. It does not in any way attempt to tell the reader how the poem hangs together. Why does this happen, and where does it lead up to? This is characteristic not only of this poem, it's a characteristic of classical Arabic poetry in general, which has given rise to the famous uh, saying of Orient pearls at random strung. Uh, these are poems composed of individual lines, and they somehow fit together and are held together by rhyme and meaning. that's it. Now what I'd like to do, uh, checking the time first of all, is to invite you to compare the beginning and the end of the poem. If you, co if you compare the beginning and the end, we can see, was there a starting point? It's, thank you very much. <laughs> Did it start somewhere? And is there a recognizing, recognizable ending? Thank you. So the start are um, the famous lines about the doves, or doves of the Arak tree, uh, which you have read. Um, what we make of this, the cooing of the doves is, as most of you will know, a very ancient theme of Arabic poetry. It goes back to pre-Islamic times. The cooing of the doves evokes the sorrow, in the, in the listener evokes the sorrow for a, a, a lost love. Um, and of course here is a lost love in a dual sense, as I explained at the beginning. What Ibn Arabi does with this image is what he does with all the images of classical Arabic love poetry. He revalues them and makes them into ayat, in Quranic sense, makes them into signs that point to an anterior reality. They, on the one hand, point to human love. On the other hand, they point to divine love. And what's more, <coughs> the trees on which the doves sit are trees with medicinal capacities. The Arak tree provides the miswak, which um, uh, is used to not only clean the teeth, but actually to purify the mouth. The ban, the, the, the ban tree is a moringa, which is a tree with remarkable medicinal capacities. And Ibn Arabi in his, in his commentary makes clear that these two trees are indications of divine attributes, purification on the one hand, and purification and sanctification on the one hand, and transcendence, tanzih, on the other. So taking it all together, what we see here is something that happens throughout the Divan. Poetic images on the one hand and manifestations of nature on the other. 
have their real meaning. On the other hand, they also have a divine meaning, an ulterior meaning. They are treated as manifestations of the divine attributes in this world. In other words, everything that exists, whether it's a poetic theme or whether it's a manifestation of nature, is a sign. And here we find yet one more correspondence between Plotinus, Ibn Arabi, and indeed the Quran. Uh, Plotinus says, all things are filled with signs whose signification derives from a single united breath of life. The breath of life even carries an echo of Nafas al-Rahman, the divine breath in Ibn Arabi. All things are signs. Once again, for Ibn Arabi, of course, this insight comes from the Quran because everything created is nothing other than an ayah. It is itself and it is a pointer to an ulterior reality. Now, if we look now at the end, let us look at the last two lines, remembering the, the, the beginning, because the beginning was all pain and sorrow and don't disclose my love, don't make, me, don't make me suffer more. At the end, we have these lines. I profess the creed of love, wherever its caravans their faces turn, for love is my doctrine and my faith. We have exemplars in Hind of Bishr and her sister, Qais, and her sister, Qais and Leila, also May and Raylan. Now, if we compare beginning and end, we actually see that there is a huge contrast between the two. The beginning is love concealed, sorrow, and as doves that symbolize the separation of lovers. At the end, we have love proclaimed openly, adinu bidinil hobbi, there is no hiding whatsoever. We have a joyful assertion. There is in the, the, at the end of the poem, there is no sign of sorrow, of pain whatsoever. He is asserting who he is. He is proud of what he is. And we have a companionship. He is suddenly a member of a new group of people, which are all the lovers of the past. They are his example. He is integrated within them. So there's very clearly a movement from one point to an end point. You can see this in the contrast. This particular contrast is greatly reminiscent of the structure of the Qasida from pre-Islamic times, which um, ever since then started with the sorrow of the lover's separation and ended with a complete, on a completely different note. It was praise, essentially, praise of the tribe. The poet at the beginning is separated from his love. At the end, he is integrated with his tribe. A new ideology is being professed at the end. It's the ideology of tribal valor and, and vigor, which takes over from the lost love at the beginning. And in the middle, there is the experience that leads to this transformation. In the old poem, it's a journey. It's a desert journey, which is a journey of hardship. It is the transformation that leads from this beginning to this end. The question then is, in this poem also, we have a transformative experience. What is, what's the thing in this poem that causes this transformation? Well, clearly we have a journey in this poem, but it's a journey to Mecca. And especially we have a particular kind of movement. It's not a movement from A to B. It's a circular movement. It's the movement around the Kaaba. It's the circular movement which is at the center of this poem, which is really at issue in this particular transformation, I think. How do we get to the circular movement in the middle? We get through it, he, the poet is driven to it through pain. If we look at these lines, he says, he speaks about concealed torment at the beginning, then there are spirits that bring annihilation, it's fena, but it is, it, it's clearly a, a traumatic experience, because afterwards there are still pangs of passion and affliction and distress and passionate love. All this is driving him to that center. And um, then we have this line here, the circle around my heart hour after hour, these spirits circle around my heart hour after hour in distress and passionate love and kiss the veil of my pillars. The love is inside in the form of these spirits that circle around the heart. Why? Because in the heart is the ultimate beloved. But at the same time, these spirits can't reach it. It's 
You're looking for, in fact, you're looking for something in yourself which you know is there, but you can't find it. You can't get at it. And it's at that point that we get to these lines. And what I found particularly fascinating in Michael's description earlier is that these very two lines, which are the center of this poem, are not in the earlier version, which is something we can discuss later. But for now, let us assume that they are part of it. And in these, uh, uh, in these lines, we find that very clearly stated was already, what was already uh, hinted at at the beginning, that we are talking here about the pilgrimage. Now, are these two, what, what's the significance of these lines? What is very clear is that these lines contain allusions to the Futuhat Nakia uh, and to that particular passage in which Ibn Arabi describes when he first arrived in Mecca and he first saw the Kaaba and he thought, this is just a pile of stones. What am I doing here? Why am I walking around a pile of stones? And then um, he heard this voice that told him, wake up, look at this with a purified heart and you will see what this is all about. So, um, and these are the lines of this poem, look at the house, it lies, shine openly for display to purified hearts. So the issue of reason and the heart, which we encounter at the end, it, is, it's, it first occurs at this particular moment, when going to Mecca makes you realize the limitations of that intellect and opens his eyes to an ulterior reality. The next uh, relevant issue is that when he was in front of the Kaaba, he heard a voice, which was clearly a divine intimation, that spoke to him and said in particular these words, whoever binds me to one form rather than another worships the image he has made of me, not me. Man qayyadani bi suratin duna sura fitakhayyulahu abada. And that, of course, is precisely uh, the lesson that is being displayed at the end of the poem. Surah, here is the word surah. Many surahs appear at the end that the heart is able to accept. So we realize it is actually it, the pilgrimage experience. This, this is the key moment when the insight, which comes out at the end of the poem, is first experienced by the poet. And then we have another thing which is extremely important, and that is the whole issue of circularity, of moving around a center, which brings us to one more point of convergence between Plotinus and Ibn Arabi. Because for both of them, the image, a geometric image of circle and center is one of the images they use to explain the mystery of transcendence and immanence. And for both of them, the circular movement is the only movement that makes sense. You never can move from A to B because the only destination that makes sense is that destination that you can never really reach in this life, namely God. So all that you can do is go around that, this, that hidden destination. And so uh, for both uh, Ibn Arabi and Plotinus, there is no escape from circularity even at the cosmic level. Because as Plotinus says, the universal soul runs around God and embraces him lovingly. Circular movement starts at the very top of creation. The universal soul already is engaged in circumambulation. The stars are engaged in circular movement. And on Earth, we have the circumambulation of the Kaaba that mirrors all this. And in ourselves, we have that image of the spirits moving around the heart. So there is a circular a hierarchy of circular movement, which is absolutely cosmic, and which is uh, where these two thinkers meet. Um, one more thing about them, the argument they use to prove, to explain transcendent demons through the geometric image is strikingly similar. Plotinus says about the center of the circle, what the center is like is revealed through the radial lines. It is as if it was spread out without being spread out. Typical Plotinus, it's spread out and yet it's not spread out. But the center is like spread out by the radiuses of a circle, but it's still, there's still a center. Now, uh, uh, Ibn Arabi says in the Futuhat, in the circle, manyness has become manifest from the one in entity, i.e. the center of the circle, without the one becoming many in essence. 
which is really exactly the same idea. So what we find at the center of this poem, if these two lines are part of it, we'll talk about later what, what it would be like if they weren't there, but if the two lines are part of it, we find a transformative experience we find a journey to the center of the world, which is at the same time a journey to the center of the self, to the heart. We find the, the secret of immanence and transcendence is revealed through this echo of what, were, what the poet was told in front of the Kaaba. We find an archetypal movement around the Kaaba being engaged in. And lastly, we find this image of the kiss which is really like a consummation of divine love, the prophet kissing the stone. And what I think is significant is that the prophet is not kissing the stone, he is kissing ahjar, he's kissing stones. And it's as though the plural here was already a preparation for the plurality of the manifestations of divinity which we encounter at the end of the poem. I should say that the kissing of the stone also uh, immediately evokes an echo to that particular chapter of Futuhat at the beginning because Ibn Arabi there also kisses the black stone and suddenly realizes that this is a manifestation of the right hand of God. Mm? So all this is packed into the associations of these central lines. So what happens after um, the recollection of this experience? The mood of the poem changes completely after that, we no longer have any mention of sorrow, of sadness, of despair, of... It's something else. The emotion that takes over is ajab, is wonder. And here, a couple of lines of those. Among the most wondrous things is a gazelle in veils, which hints with fingers, fingertips, dyed with red with jujube, and wings with eyelids. Its grazing ground lies between my chest and my innermost self. How wondrous is a garden in the midst of fires. Here we find one more convergence between Protinus and Arabi. It is this experience of wonder, the utter amazement of the soul when it suddenly catches a glimpse of that ultimate reality and at the same time realizes that that ultimate reality is actually part of you. Um, an, an extract from Plotinus. The soul turned to the good, which here stands for the one, and it was utterly amazed. Since it held something of it in itself, it had an intimate awareness of it, and came into a state of longing, like those who are moved by an image of the beloved one, of the loved one, to wish to see that same beloved. The most important words here for me are the words since it held something of it in itself, the soul realizes that what it is looking at is actually in itself already. And that is also here in the Arabi, in the image. The grazing ground of the gazelle lies between my chest and my innermost self. It's actually part of me. So you can see the orientation of the thinkers here is quite the same. And it's after this that we come to the famous verses of the uh, heart adopting any form. So you can see from that perspective how these verses actually emanate out of an insight, a profound insight, which is alluded to in the progression of the poem. And so where does the poem actually end up? Let's look at the end again. Um, what is happening at the end? There, there is this key line here, which is the great declaration, the declaration of the new, of the faith that he has resolved to keep. I profess the creed of love wherever its caravans their faces turn, for love is my doctrine and my faith. What I think is very interesting here for our purposes is the Arabic tawajjahat, which literally means to turn your face. Now tawajjahat in this context inevitably, I think, evokes the Quranic uh, phrase, فَأَيْنَ مَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ Wherever you turn, there is the face of God. The association of this uh, makes it clear that the phrase here, wherever its caravans and their faces turn, clearly is 
wherever their face is turned, there is God. It's not, doesn't matter where we go, it's that wherever we go, we come to just one place. And this brings us back to the image of the circle and the center, because here we suddenly are no longer at the circumference of the circle, but we are at the center. We are at the center of the circle, and God is all around us. And this, again, is the same idea in Plotinus. He says, he, i.e. the one, is outside the encompassment, the encompassment of all things. And in Arabi, again, says he encompasses everything just as the circle's circumference preserves the center point's existence. We are at the center point. Wherever we turn, there is the Lord. Once again, Ibn Arabi doesn't get it from Plotinus. He gets it from the Quran. Innahu bikulli shay'in muhayt. He encompasses everything. The Lord encompasses everything. So you can see the image of the circle has two sides. On the one side, we are at the circumference. On the other side, we are at the center. They are both equally true, like transcendence and immanence are both equally true. Now, the image of the face um, brings to mind something that Stephen Hertenstein talked about this morning, the notion of the Welsh khas, the private face that we all have in ourselves. Because wherever we turn in this poem, actually we are turning towards our private face. And Ibn Arabi um, says, again, from the geometrical image, the line that emerges from the center point towards one point of the circumference is the specific face or the private face that everything, every existent thing has from its creator. What, what it means basically is that each of us have a trace of this divine presence that we carry in us. He called it the wedge khas. And we have to turn towards that and at the same time we are turning towards ourselves because we carry it in us. So there's again a doubleness. We turn towards something far away, but in actual fact, at the same time, we turn towards something which is right there inside us. Precisely the same idea linked again to the image of the face we find in Plotinus, where he says, if one likens the good, i.e. the one, the Lord, to a richly varied sphere, or imagine it as a thing, all faces, shining with living faces, just like the many faces on the circumference of the average circle, one would, be seeing it, one would be seeing it as one sees another from outside. But one must become that and make oneself the contemplation. Here again is the idea that actually you not, don't have to look at something we have to, on the contrary, direct the gaze exactly in the opposite direction, <coughs> namely inside yourself. You have to become yourself the contemplation. And I think in Bhagavad we would 100% uh, subscribe to this. So this really is the end of the journey of this particular poem. So what conclusions does this leave us with? We started out with this idea of uh, parallels between Plotinus and Ibn Arabi. And, well, we found quite a few of them. The earthly, heavenly love, the transcendence, the immanence, the inadequacy of reason, the fact that everything is a sign, the notion of circularity, the wonder, and then also, most importantly, this idea of the ascent of the soul, that there's a, that, that there's a dynamic process happening here, that you have to grow, you have to mature, you have to you have to understand this fundamental lesson, the notion of ascent. All these things are there. But at the same time, what we've seen is that Ibn Arabi's poem does not contain a recognizable thread of Greece. The whole poem can be fully explained and understood as emanating out of the Arabic literary tradition and the Quran. We don't need Plotinus at all to understand what go what's going on in this poem. What does this mean? Well, I think it gives us cause to ponder uh, about the nature of that great Arabic tradition. First of all, there's the question of the poetic form. What we have with this Qasida is something which produces a very remarkable combination of unity and multiplicity. Um, 
And through that combination produces this particular form which has the capacity of generating ascent, an experience of ascent. Unity is immanent, how? There's got only one rhyme, only one meter, and one statement per verse. But then the number of verses is indeterminate. You can have any number of verses. How do these verses really hang together? What's the meaning of all of them together? That's not stated. This is what I call the transcendent unity of the Arabic poem. There's no narrative. There's no argument. The experience, the unity of the poem has to be subjectively experienced. There's a transformative power here at work, but it's not argued out at all. It's something that you go through through the juxtaposition of images. And amazingly enough, this very juxtaposition of images is is the perfect form to produce the ideology which says that God reveals himself ever new in ever diverse forms. So this particular poetic form allows a whole string of diversity to be enchained together without evident connection of story or argument and put it in front of you and then tells you, you make sense of it. That's it. That's, this is the experience. And all that really hangs it together is one key feature, which is purely formal, and that is circularity, that in many, many poems, beginning and end relate, and there is something in the middle which is the moment of cataclysm, of transformation. These are purely abstract uh, elements. They have no, so to say, content uh, determination whatsoever. So in actual fact, this, particular, this poetic form has the capacity, more than any other, to give expression to the very ideology that we are talking about here. And it's ancient, it predates the translation of Plotinus by centuries. Next thing is the Quran. We found that all, virtually all the echoes between the Quran and between in Arabic and Plotinus actually go through the Quran. Ah, yes, at <laughs> this one here, Eniad. Plotinus says, beauty rests upon the material form when it has been brought into a unity. Bring into unity means understanding the unity of a poem. So in this particular Qasida form, we are constantly being challenged to manufacture, to generate that beauty in ourselves because of the challenge it poses of understanding how these poems fit together. And of course, we have the issue here, very interestingly, that the two central lines definitely did not form part of the original poem. Now, I was delighted when I heard this this morning because it proves a point that I'm trying to make here. You can take something out of it and it still is a poem because there's no argument, no storyline. It doesn't matter if you take something out. It's still there and it's a new way that you're being challenged to make it hang together. And of course, in off, very often, Arabic poems are cited. People take individual lines, put them together, and almost make a new poem by generating these individual lines. It's up to you to see how they run. Hmm? So it's a, actually an integral part of this particular poetic poem. Um, but come to speak of the Quran, uh, we have Quranic parallels. The biggest one of all is Tawhid. The absolutely rigorous focus on oneness in Plotinus is precisely, of course, echoed in the Quran. And then we have the whole issue of transcendence and immanence we talked about, reason versus the heart, that everything is a sign, that everything is endowed with speech, everything is ensouled. Uh, and then we have three more that I didn't mention because they didn't form part, I, I could have, but we have the idea of the creative word, the, the kalima, that creates uh, in Plotinus, we have the Logos Spermaticos, which is again a kind of word which generates the f through, the, through which the intellect generates the forms of existence. We have the notion of remembrance, which is, of course, a Platonic one as well. In, 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 uh, this wonderful line in the Quran, Uthkuruni Athkurkum, remember me so that I may remember you. Mm? The idea of remembrance is absolutely central, like in, like in the Platonic tradition. We have the notion, lastly, of the return to the one. Um, these are just random 
aspects put together, but what we can see from that is that in actual fact the Quran uh, is a receptacle of a remarkable number of parallels with this uh, great Platonic tradition. Once again, I think one is tempted to say that the echo of that tradition in the Arabic uh, world predates by centuries the actual translation of the Plant Hanus' text, that there was in late antiquity an aura, a certain way of seeing the world, which was influenced by that tradition, again, not directly by Plotinus, but by somebody like, for instance, Dionysius the Areopagite, the famous writings of Pseudo Dionysius that, uh, that they transformed the Plotinus tradition into the backbone of Christian mysticism. There were many texts around in late antiquity that already prepared the world for this particular vision. <coughs> and what then came along is a text that takes the Tawhid of Plotinus absolutely seriously and revolutionizes Judaism and Christianity with a renewed focus, absolute focus on the one. So that's, these are the kind of consequences uh, that one can, um, one is tempted to draw from this. This is, of course, very, very tentative. But my last word really is uh, going back to those two famous verses that everybody knows and that are cited all the time out of context. And they look like a sort of um, modern type of relativism, i.e. everything is the same at the end of the day. If we look at them in context, nothing could be further from the truth. What we see is that key insight that Imam Arabi talks about here emerges or emanates from the very heart of his own tradition. It emerges from confrontation with the Kaaba itself. This is not a stepping away from his religion. It's stepping into his religion in the deepest sense possible. That's where this insight comes from. And I think it, in today's world, it leads us into reflecting upon what this understanding of transcendence and immanence of God really means for a world that has to live with a multiplicity of cultures which have to be accepted and understood in their own terms. I think there is a lesson here in this tradition which is extremely important and relevant to the present day, which is why I think it is eminently worth thinking about it and studying it. Thank you very much. Yeah, but I, I, what I would say is that um, the, the experiential and subjective, it's not just historical and cultural. For my purposes, um, the historical and cultural is the general framework of experience, but really the really important thing is how the reader individually, at the particular moment of, of, of reading the poem, experiences it. It's a, it's a, I, I'm trying to get at something much more personal, because we're talking here about a transformative experience. Something is going on in this poem. Some, something changes. And, and you're experiencing it not because the poem tells you, I'm going to make you change now in this and this and this way. Here's my recipe. No. You feel changed because of a succession of emotions that you are confronted with. And then with the question of, well, 
And so, and where, where, where do you find yourself afterwards? It's a, it's a much more immediate personal confrontation with the text that this produces. Now, the cultural, of course, comes into it because if you are somebody who lives in this tradition already, then you expect the structure to, to, to run that way. And you also understand the overtones, the allusions that many of these images have. And once you understand the allusions, then also the sequencing becomes more easy to follow. But there is still a huge openness when it comes to the question of how does the whole thing make sense? Um, so I think there is a combination of the historical culture on the one hand and the psychological, the individual psychological experience on the other. To make clear what I mean, the, 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 the other, uh, at the other end of the spectrum for me uh, of the Casilla form is a sonnet. The sonnet has a very clear-cut number of lines and the sonnet is, 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 a, is a very powerful receptacle for an argument. The most powerful sonnets are those sonnets that produce an argument by the end of which you feel as you've been hit by an arrow in your heart. Bam! You know, it's just, it shocks you. Because it's, it's a, a, a tightly woven structure which, is in, which the intellect can grasp, um, and, and also the emotions. So this is something completely different. Uh, you see what I mean? I'm talking about, and um, just one more thing. It also brings into question uh, the structure of the Quran. The Quranic surahs are actually structured very, very similar to Hasidas. They are also many of the, the Quran is not a storybook at all. There's only one story told in the Quran, Surah 12, but even that one is told by illusions. Most of the stories in the Quran are alluded to here and there, hints at this and hints at that. Storytelling is not the aim. The aim is to create emotion in you, to move you through a combination of factors which you rationally cannot actually understand and follow. The unity of the surah is like the unity of Hasida. It's a similar phenomenon. Yeah. Yes. What's then interesting, they said, what religion will you have? And they said, what's it got to do with religion? Yes, 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 yes. No, thank thank you. you very much. It's a great comment. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
Just a, a, a brief answer to what you were saying, what's it got to do with the religion? Well, I think the best comment actually is those two lines by Ibn Arabi that I read, that the heart becomes, can assume any form, because ultimately that heart is one. That's the, the difference that is between understanding and knowing. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.